After 10 years, Chris Maloney is back as Detective Elliot Stabler in his own spin-off of the NBC Law & Order franchise, Organized Crime. I'm Denton Davidson for Gold Derby. Chris, I got to start with the question, what brought you back to this character and how were you pitched this new series, Law & Order, Organized Crime? Uh, well, the pitch was funny because the pitch came out, uh, as I understood it, was going to be eight episodes. And uh, that's how we're going to film it. So it'd be a serialized as opposed to uh, you know, individual units of entertainment, episodic. And um, I, I thought, whoa, so we're just going to do eight episodes a year. I'm, I'm all on board. <laughs> <laughs> then they told me, no, 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 it's going to be 22 episodes a year. Uh, you know, so uh, it was a bait and switch, I think. <laughs> and, uh, no, you know, they, they uh, look, they said all the right things, which was, you know, I think with the serialization, um, I thought there, there, there was a great opportunity for expansion of, of uh, behaviors and characters and deeper details of storytelling and people that had given, be given a little bit more time to invest in the guest stars and um, you know, just a little richer storytelling. At least that's what I thought. And I, I think we kind of pulled that off uh, you know, out of the box with the first date. Yeah, I mean, this law and order in general is so embedded in American television. It's been around for over 30 years. And yeah. this, this series in the franchise definitely has a completely different vibe um, where there's a couple long arcing stories throughout rather than this episodic uh, format. Is that something you're gonna be able to maintain moving forward with, with more episodes or is that gonna be a challenge? I think it's gonna definitely be a challenge. Uh, thank God we have Eileen Chaikin as the showrunner who's uh, leading the charge, or as I like to say, you know, she, her job is to break the big rocks. You know, <laughs> she has to go in there and, and break the stories and figure, out, figure it all out. Um, yeah, you know, it's on Eileen. I think she's a great storyteller. She's a wonderful leader and collaborator. So, uh, you know, there's, and there's no end of uh, storylines to follow. Um, so we're going to do our best. <laughs> and one of the great things about this uh, series is we also get to see a lot more of the personal side of Elliot as mm -hmm. he's grappling with the murder of his wife and his own mental health issues. What is that like exploring Elliot's more human side as he works through grief and these relationships with his own family? Um, <clears throat> well, you know, it really is what you get into the business for as in a, you know, on the acting side of things, right? You want to explore characters a little more deeply. You want to be able to, you know, roam around in their skin and in their psyche. And, uh, you know, strict procedurals don't always allow for that kind of exploration. Um, but I, I think they've, they've struck a really good balance, which is, you know, stay with us to, you know, go on this, you know, hopefully wild ride of un unraveling a crime, but, um, you know, stay, stay engaged with us because we're going to get a little more in depth with uh, the people that hopefully you'll fall in love with and follow. And I have to mention Mariska Hargitse makes many appearances this season and the relationship mm -hmm. between Olivia and Elliot is as complicated as ever, of course. Um, what's that like working with Mariska again after all these years? Uh, like slipping into a warm bath, you know, <laughs> it's, you know, the end, you set it up just right, the temperature's just right, and you're like, ah, and you relax and, you know, it's, uh, it's really been wonderful. Really was she surprised when, when she found out you were doing this again? No. No, I think uh, I got the impression that uh, the feeling was it's about time and please say yes. Uh, and I guess it was about time. Um, obviously it was because I, I would not have said yes if I didn't if I weren't 100% committed, because I know what, you know, uh, 22 episodes takes. That's really a long haul. And I've already done it. You know, I, I'd already done it. Yeah. Anytime. So I was, you know, you have to think uh, long and hard. 
Uh, and chemistry is so important on screen. It's something people loved about watching you and Marushka together. Mm -hmm. um, I want to mention Danielle Monet Truett plays your new partner in Sergeant yeah. Iana Bell. And I love her character because she's never in the mood for anyone's garbage. Um, and she's great in this. What is that new partnership like? Well, well uh, I, I'm really trying to think deeply, but I'll say right off, it's fantastic. She and I have a great working relationship. Uh, I don't think I'm talking out of school to say we've found a, a, a love and a camaraderie uh, with each other, um, a trust, which is really important. So, you know, we are, uh, it's very funny because, you know, it's, it's Elliot and Benson, and now it's Elliot and Bell. And uh, so we're kind of aware of this triangle of, uh, you know, I don't know, triangle. So it's been great working with her. Uh, it, it's it's kind of cool on my end because I was there at the beginning when the evolution and the birth of Benson and Stabler occurred and I was part of that. And now I feel as though it's kind of happening again that it's, you know, what is this new birth of, of Stabler and Bell gonna be? And now it's Stabler, Bell and Benson. It's, uh, it's interesting. And the character of Ayana also offers Elliot's character <clears throat> someone to really learn from. She schools him a little bit about being black, lesbian, female, mm -hmm. and sort of reminds him how many breaks he's gotten over in his career that she would have never been afforded to her. How important is that to, that we keep seeing Elliot evolve in this way? Well, you know, that's, that is one way to look at it. And we had this discussion. I said, but you know what is just as important? And I feel very strongly about the, my character, Elliot Stabler, that on the flip side of that coin is the assumption that, oh, you're a white male in this profession, so you must think this way. You know, you're automatically prejudiced or are uncomfortable around, you know, uh, whether it's black or female in authority or a, lesbian and i was very adamant about you know that's not where stabler resides and so you know we there were there's that scene in the car where she and i have that moment yeah and you know there's a little bit of her going oh you know you're a little more woke than i thought you were <laughs> <laughs> whereas you know, you know stabler's well aware he's got a long road ahead of him but um you know that was a I, i'm glad uh, they were touching on all of these elements of what's happening in society today and i but i i did uh, i felt as though i i it was imperative for me to to defend elliot in that regard and we do see her you know go to her partner at some point and say mm. i trust him um which i think is important um that viewers see that as well uh, but in the past, Elliot wasn't always accepted by the book. He had sort of this reputation of roughing up some suspects uh, mm -hmm. in SVU. And um, he's not exactly a cop any of us or most of us would, would want to encounter necessarily. Um, but in the current climate of America and the police brutality that's under a microscope now, was that a fine line to walk returning Elliot um, in this new care culture? Yes. And we've had many discussions uh, about that. And, you know, my stance was, you know, I always thought of Elliot as a man under pressure who, uh, you know, and it, with, 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 with co the constant goal of justice. But then, you know, now you have to call him question, well, you know, your justice can be construed as vigilanteism or can be construed as you know, the lone wolf, you know, uh, being judge, jury, and executioner, um, which I think Elliot is aware, but he's learning because he's been out of the country. He's, he, but he, he's aware of the tone and the timber of the day. Uh, he's still learning a lot of lessons, uh, and I also just feel as though, you know, how a man acts in his thirties and forties or acts out may be under, put under the category of impetuous or undisciplined, but you know, if he's acting out or acting in that way in his late fifties, that's problematic. 
I don't yeah. think it's a very attractive quality because you know, and you it's the word of evolution. You know, you we're hoping to see a character who has evolved and has, has as new techniques to navigate life's problems. And I think it's nice to see um, not only this, the series tackling the way black men are treated by police, but it also mm -hmm. gives a perspective of the police and, and the way they're sort of grappling with the issue within their own departments um, as well. Yeah, we, we've had we've had wonderful discussions. Uh, the whole wolf, wolf organization with Connie Rice. Uh, she's a cousin to Condoleezza Rice, and she has spent her life working uh, both sides: a uh, uh, defender, a uh, prosecutor, and now she's trying to bridge the gaps um, out of LA with uh, policing uh, for police forces and underserved communities or communities that feel as though the, the, the police are not doing their best to service these particular communities. So um, we've had great, very frank, uh, in-depth and intelligent, at least on her part, discussions uh, about that dynamic. And I think that's what we're trying to do. We're trying, you know, we're not trying to, um, um, I'll say this, if we do things correctly, we can showcase exactly or to the best of our ability what is happening and maybe be a part of a dialogue or a healing or a coming together and, or an understanding within both communities, the blue and the uh, underserved communities. And we mentioned the differences um, of this series with the other Law and Orders, but something that remains the same is the timeliness of, of these episodes. This season takes place during COVID-19. It sort of kicks off with the robbery of a vaccine shipment. And Dylan McDermott plays Richard Wheatley, the son of a notorious mobster. He's the villain this season, but Dylan's so charismatic, we love hating him. Um, what's that like going toe to toe with him in this series? Uh, it was so much fun. And uh, he and I had uh, quite a few rather long discussions because we, uh, we both came out of the same uh, acting technique, the Meis Meisner technique, uh, the neighborhood playhouse. And we're of the same years, uh, approximately. And I have found that when I work with someone who has done the Meisner technique, there's a shorthand to how we approach the work. And, it, you know, it's, it's not writer or anything, but it, it really just is. It's, a, it's just that much easier. And you, you just share certain instincts and how you approach the work. And, it's, and, and at least for me, it becomes a richer experience. And my understanding is you grew up playing football and then studied history. That's what Wikipedia says. <laughs> um, That's my life. That, that, that is basically my life. In the next and then time. how did you end up getting an acting bug and, and just completely changing the traje trajectory of your career? Um, I took, um, you know, I had a little bit of space on my college schedule for an, uh, an elective. And I thought, you know, let's do something fun. I'd never really kind of done anything fun. And I thought acting, let me, let me see what this acting thing is about. And man, you know, that expression, you know, that I got bit by the bug. I, I know what that feeling is. Um, and then that in turn turned into you being nominated for an Emmy at some point. We're an awards website at Gold Derby. We, we love tracking, tracking all of those things. Do you remember attending that first big awards ceremony that you were invited to and, and what that feeling was like? Uh, it was uh, overwhelming. I was uh, ill prepared. It was... Uh, <laughs> as though you got invited to a big party. You know, it's like Woody Allen on the train. You're looking at the fun train and you're on the death train. Uh, one of those movies. It was, uh, yeah, you're finally on the inside <laughs> looking out. Uh, and uh, it was, they really know how to throw a party, those Hollywood types. <laughs> and what I remember most was my 18-month-old uh, son, Dante, learned to swim, or yeah, about 20-month-old, uh, Dante learned to swim. Oh, how was that? At the, at the hotel pool. <laughs> because, well, you know, that's what I remember. 
<laughs> you're still mostly based on the East Coast, correct? Or are you? Yeah, yeah. I'm in New York now. Yeah, we just moved back. I was I did a my stint in LA for about seven. Years. Okay. Um, and organized crime recently renewed for a second season that will consist of more episodes as we talked about before. Do you have any teases for that at all, or is it still a closed book? I, I'm teaseless only because they are, as we speak, they are starting the writer's room. Well, we can at least say that. So thank you for that. Uh, Chris, thanks for chatting with me today. Um, about Law and Order Organized Crime. I wanna encourage our viewers our viewers here to head over to goldderby.com and make your awards predictions, beat the top prognos prognosticators in Hollywood and watch more videos with top contenders. Um, it was good talking with you today, Chris. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure was all mine, thank you.